I'd like to welcome um, Erella Hovers from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel, who is going to talk about continuity and change in research about the Neanderthals in the Levant. Thank you uh, for inviting me to this conference. It's my first time here and I'm very excited. And uh, I would like to, well, first to talk about the title of this talk. Uh, what you see here is not a mistake. Uh, when I was invited, I was asked to talk about Neanderthal behavior and I was thinking I'll do it about the Levant. And then when I started preparing the talk, I thought I don't really acknowledge the concept of Neanderthal behavior. I don't think there's such a thing. And so I will be talking about Middle Paleolithic behavior, uh, research on Middle Paleolithic rather than Neanderthal behavior in uh, the Levant. Ah, other way? Okay. So I will start with a presentation of the region. And uh, you have the scale at the bottom. Ah, I do too. You have the scale at the bottom of the figure. It's about 500 kilometers. The, uh, white lines mark more or less the boundaries of what is known as the Levant. And I think in this particular case, this is a, a, a marking that actually follows geographical uh, boundaries. Uh, there's the sea to the west, there's the uh, desert uh, belt to the south, um, the rift and a little bit beyond, and then you move again into uh, desertic areas, and then there's the high uh, mountains of the Zagros. So in many ways, this is really a confined, a physically confined areas, the f configuration of which would cause at least uh, um, occasionally problems for populations trying to move uh, from one place or the other. And uh, this is a region that has been a, a pain in archaeologists' backside uh, from basically the day the first discoveries were made there. Uh, early days, uh, um, officially the beginning of uh, research on prehistory in the Levant and on the Middle Paleolithic in the Levant uh, was in 1925, the excavations of Terville Peter in Zutia Cave in uh, Amud uh, drainage. Um, the approach was totally Eurocentric because uh, Terville Peter, Gerard Neville, and other researchers, uh, Roost, other researchers who worked in the area were trained in, in uh, Europe, and that was the only paradigm that existed. So things were researched and tailored, I'm using the word consciously, uh, to fit uh, the, the uh, Eurocentric paradigm. The main interest of re these early researchers was to, uh, to understand the original record, because nothing was there before. They were pioneers in that respect. And so they were interested in stratigraphy, they were interested in chronology. In the 1930s, there was not much to be said about chronology. Uh, and uh, they were looking at material culture and asking mainly questions about how material cultures could help figuring out the timeline and the geographic uh, spatial distributions of cultures as they understood them. Uh, the material culture was what Bode would called in the 50s and 60s, typical Mousterian. Um, and so much so that when Terville Peter excavated the Zutia cave in, the 19, in 1925, and he found the Zutia fossil, which I think John Hawkes uh, showed this morning, he immediately, um, because it was, oh, there was some uh, uh, Middle Paleolithic, uh, uh, there was some Middle Paleolithic stone tools in the area, he immediately defined it as a Neanderthal, or he and his uh, uh, physical, the physical anthropologist working with him identified it as a Neanderthal just because of this connection. And uh, following his work, and mainly the work of Dorothy Gerd in uh, the Amud, um, the <laughs> Tabu, um, uh, Mugara, Vadi Mugara, Nachal Me'arot, uh, which I think Mina uh, may relate to in her talk, uh, there was a stratigraphic and cultural framework built for the Levant, a three-stage uh, sequence, material culture sequence based on the three uh, units, stratigraphic units that Gerald identified, or oh, Middle Paleolithic stratigraphic units that Gerald identified in her work 
in that area, in that uh, case, in Tumun. Uh, in terms of chronology, there was nothing much to do. There was a, an attempt to relate fauna. There was not much by way of pollen at the time uh, to relate it to the uh, glacial, interglacial, uh, stadial, interstadial phases of Europe. And the sites that were excavated because of the goals of this uh, early stage of the research were mainly the cave sites because that's where the stratigraphies, the deep stratigraphies were, and that's where you could talk about what comes next and what comes earlier and what is earlier than what and so on, because that was the only way uh, to go. And uh, as late as the 1980s, Jelinek, who returned to Tubun, was basically following a, a similar argument that his Okay, he was uh, looking at Gerard's sequence. Um, he placed it in a timeline based on what was then a, a novel approach, the marine isotope uh, stage record shown here on the uh, uh, right side. <coughs> and following the uh, European view, he placed the middle paleolithic record of Tabun totally within uh, the uh, last glacial uh, phase. So. This left very little time for the Middle Paleolithic or the Mustian, as it was called then in the Levant. Uh, the whole Tabun sequence was pressed into something like 40,000 years. And let me tell you, Jelinek was generous because if you ask God about it, he would give this maybe 12,000 years for reasons that have very little to do with archaeology. So with such a compressed time frame, there's really not much that you can do. Uh, it came, it went, <laughs> basically, in terms of a, a prehistory. And a, by the end of the a 99, a 1980s, a, this picture started to change because of several a, developments. A, one, which I'll refer to later, was the a, a groundbreaking a, paper by a, Khan et al., which proposed, based on the mitochondrial DNA of extant populations, that uh, human origins could be traced back to Africa. They suggested a time frame, which archaeologists were not excited about. But this was, a, I think, to the best of my knowledge, uh, if someone knows differently, I'll be happy to hear about it, the first time that some earlier claims by paleontologists, by uh, biogeographers who argue that actually uh, there was that modern humans and the faunas coming with them uh, emerged from Africa. That was the first time that it came from a, an independent line of evidence and that unleashed the whole out of Africa debate back and forth, uh, which we are still contending with today. And uh, the second uh, development was the changes in uh, dating chronology. And I think this is where the paradigm, the old Eurocentric paradigm really broke. And we are looking at a, a whole a new kettle of fish. So by the 19, 1985, you can see the classical uh, point of view, Neanderthal sites, or sites with Neanderthal remains, and I will go uh, in a little bit into the issue of Neanderthals and moderns, are uh, here in sort of pink, and uh, sites associated with uh, modern humans are in blue. So 1985, Neanderthals are earlier, moderns are later, uh, and that's without any radiometric dating because there were none available at the, uh, no methods were available at the time. 1987, the application of thermoluminescence uh, techniques to burnt flint, burnt uh, chert from uh, the site of Kafze, moved Kafze, as you can see in the middle column here, uh, quite a ways down to somewhere between 100 and 90,000 years. So. Here we have modern humans that are earlier than the Neanderthals in, or oh, the presumed dates for the Neanderthals in the Levant and uh, also for presumed dates of Neanderthals in Europe. A few years after that, Taboon was dated and you can see that Taboon moved way back down to about 160 by TL uh, measurements. Uh, Kafze uh, and Schul were dated to somewhere between 
120, that's all, and Kafze is about, as I said, 100 to 90. Uh, Kebara was dated to 60,000. Amun was not dated at the time, but it remained more or less in the same place. So there is really a big change here. We do have a, a proof that the relationship between Neanderthals and moderns, at least in the Levant and probably beyond, were not a linear pro progression or procession, but there was something else much more interesting uh, going on. And this is a partial picture of what we see today. Um, uh, sites that have no color are sites without human remains, but you can see that the distribution of the dates is really uh, extensive. There are many, many uh, dated sites um, and layers within sites, and the picture remains that Neanderthals are, in fact, younger, or maybe in some parts of the sequence, and I will show you this in a minute, uh, more or less contemporaneous with uh, these anatomically modern humans of Shul, Kafze, and Taboon, because Taboon C2 is considered to be a, a modern human. And this is the new chronological framework that we are looking at when we look at the Levant. So instead of 40, we have 250, give, or 200, 200 thousand years, give or take. And that's a lot of time to do a lot of mischief. So, out of Africa, one thing, and a lot of time, and uh, there's a long Middle Paleolithic record, and uh, this extended time span opens up uh, the, the way for many interesting questions about the Levant and about uh, the human populations of the Middle Paleolithic, also beyond the Levant. I'll be focusing today mostly uh, on the uh, Levant. And, um, Instead of, oh, let's move away. Uh, so the, they said the chronology opens up the way. I think the out of Africa uh, paradigm that emerged uh, sort of uh, constricted our view because everything was put into this context. So it was moderns, Neanderthal out of Africa, from Europe, what are they doing in the Levant? And it was a confrontational in a way a, a way of thinking because you dichotomize everything and especially there's this expectation that things will finally happen and will reach the upper paleolithic with modern humans which of course is a very wrong way of thinking about these kind of issues <coughs> and so um, what I would like to do now is present very briefly some of the highlights of the middle paleolithic in the Levant and then consider uh, given the record that we know and given some uh, additional uh, studies that have been published uh, recently, how they um, maybe restructure at least my thinking about uh, this issue. So, the players. Um, so as not to break too much with tradition, I put the modern humans on one slide and the Neanderthals on another. So you have a uh, Mislia up on the left uh, you have Taboon C2, uh, which is slightly younger than Mislia, again, based on the TL dates for uh, both sites. Uh, I'll remind you that Taboon C2 is in the middle of the Taboon sequence. It's not at the beginning of the Taboon sequence. And then we have the burial, or with or without inverted commas, from Schul, uh, Kafte. And for good measure, we have Manot, which has no cultural affi uh, affinities because it was found out of context. That's the uh, skull cap uh, down left. And the two uh, modern humans fossils uh, from Ksarakil in Lebanon, which are verified modern humans, they are associated with upper Paleolithic a, a industries. So these are the modern humans within the bigger time frame that we're talking about. And here are the Neanderthals. So from a left to right, it's Amud 7, Kebara, a, and Kashish, a, a recently new find. A, the two a, uh, infants from the Deria, and you'll notice that one of them at least has a date that is very, uh, very uh, broad, 
and it could be as early as 90 or as late as 60. So it's a Neanderthal, but notice that it may overlap in time with modern humans. Then we have a, a, a mood one, which I think probably merits the designation of the latest Neanderthal in the Levant, with the date of uh, 57, give or take. It's basically the same age as Amud 7. So this is, these are the players, these are the hominids that are creating the record we are looking at. Uh, how to explain this record? Again, because it was out of Africa and coming from Europe, and how do they manage to do things? There were quite a number of models and quite a number of suggestions to try to explain the presence of these two populations. Uh, in a minute, you will see that really there is not much of a behavioral difference that we can follow from the archaeological record. So one suggestion was that uh, by Arensburg and Belfer Cohen, uh, published in 1998, I think. They started talking about it much earlier, but it was a long process to publication. Uh, they talked about a very large and variable population, uh, some of it probably coming from Africa, some of it coming from a, a Europe, but basically no specific barrier, so a variable a, a population due to gene flow. Uh, Joel Rack argued for vicariance for coming and goings of these populations due to climatic changes, and he thought that some of the less uh, typical affinities, uh, uh, anatomical affinities of Neanderthals and of moderns in the Levant were due to the fact that each of these populations uh, were at the periphery of the biogeographical range, and so their appearance would not be as classical as in the core area. Uh, John Shea uh, advanced a, a climatically forced uh, extinction of one or the other population, not necessarily Neanderthals or not necessarily uh, modern humans, due to severe climate changes uh, in the Levant. So there would be just one group at the time. Uh, or a, a, another model of competition for resources, because as we said, and I think uh, we all agree that they really are not all that different. Um, I suggested at the time there was some coexistence uh, that could be extended or not so extended uh, that was regulated by territorial mechanisms and uh, by cultural mechanisms so that kept these groups more or less apart, not an easy fit in a region as small as uh, we saw before. And uh, before we move on, I would like to indicate that uh, so far we have had no luck with trying to extract the genetic material from any of the fossils uh, in the Levant. So in the place where it might be really interesting, uh, we cannot rely on the genetic data to tilt uh, the scale one way or the other. So we have to go to archeological observation, uh, evolutionary scenarios, um, and common sense, I think, to, to make some sort of a, a, a scenario for the region. Uh, what do we have in terms of material culture? Uh, here I'm trying to show what was uh, extended from previous period, what extended into the Upper Paleolithic, what emerged during the Middle Paleolithic. So on the left you see the late Lower, lower Paleolithic, LLP. Uh, and some behaviors are really, it's really small, I cannot see what it says there. Some behaviors do extend from earlier into the Middle Paleolithic and obviously into the Upper Paleolithic, like the use of fire, the use of hearth. In the Levant, I, I know that it's a big issue in Europe. In the Levant, <laughs> there's no issue. I don't know why, maybe um, it kind of, it's kind of counterproductive given the differences in climate, but uh, as of 300,000 years ago in Kesem Cave, in uh, Mislia, in other places, people in the Levant, or hominins in the Levant, were using fire like crazy. There's ashes, there's burnt material in almost every single site, definitely in the cave sites and in many of the open air sites. So in the Levant, there's no question that Neanderthals and modern humans and Middle Paleolithic hominins in general were using fire. So that's something that emerged before the Middle Paleolithic and continues. Uh, there's a, there are other behaviors like the use of blade technology, which continues but is very different from uh, what we see in the uh, 
השלו יבודיאן, the low, late lower paleolithic of Kesem Cave, as opposed to what we see in the middle paleolithic, uh, in early middle paleolithic sites like Mislia, like Tabun, like Hayunim, etc. So the same final product being uh, achieved in very different ways, and of course it goes on into the upper paleolithic, but again in different ways. Um, Another thing that continues is, a, of course, food sharing, but again, based on the work of Mary Steiner at Kesem Cave, she suggested, and it seems a pretty convincing based on her evidence, that the way that food, and she talks about fauna, the way that fauna is shared by Ashelo uh, Yabudian groups differed from what we see uh, in the Middle Paleolithic. So the Ashelo Yabudian were more independent folks, um, they brought the, the prey into the caves, or the cave in, in the case of Kesem, but they divided it individually, whether she thinks that in the middle Paleolithic, based on the cut marks and the uh, geometry of cut marks and how they are distributed on the bones, um, there was food sharing from a person to a larger group, sitting probably around the tribal fire or something like that. Uh, other behaviors that we see in the middle Paleolithic uh, only emerge at that time and not necessarily at the beginning, for example, hafting. Uh, I'll try to show it, but this is not working well. The only evidence that we have is from late in the Middle Paleolithic in the shape of residues and some indirect evidence. I'll show it to you in a minute. Uh, but it's there, and then in the early uh, Upper Paleolithic, we don't have much evidence for it, but it comes back again uh, later. Um, and then there are other things that disappear completely, for example, the bifacial uh, component of the lithic technology, which does not continue into the uh, Middle Paleolithic and disappears completely until much later uh, in the time. Uh, burial is something that we don't know from the Ashelo Yabudian, and probably we do know from at least the times of Kafti Schul and later. But again, in the Upper Paleolithic, it's not evident at the beginning. And in fact, when you go into the Upper Paleolithic of the Levant, nothing or almost nothing that is so characteristic of the European record is there. There are no burials, there are no, uh, on, or almost no ornaments. It's tiny, it's a... Uh, very much less uh, sophisticated, uh, except for the excursion of the origination into the Levant, which brings with it everything that's origination, with the bone tools, with the beads, with things like that, and then it disappears again. So if that was a measure of anything, we would say that uh, in the Levant there were no modern humans until the Natufian, about 12,000 years ago, because that's when you start finding things that are similar to the Upper Paleolithic of Europe. <laughs> so it's a record that is based on a losses of knowledge and technology, on inventions or a transmission and learning and transmitting new technologies, of changes in technologies. It's a very dynamic record in the sense of the material culture. The lithic industries, for me, are very uh, monotonous in a way. They are based on uh, there are flake industries, there are some, like the early uh, Middle Paleolithic, that emphasize more the elongated pieces, but base are still basically uh, flake industries. Um, we don't really have specialized technologies like the Kina uh, technology or like bifacial shaping. Uh, there's Levalois and some other discoidal, um, some blade producing technologies, and the, the game, what we see, what Gerard and others uh, try to identify as specific categories is really a game of frequencies. Sometimes people emphasize this part of the technology, sometimes they emphasize other parts of the technology. It's a big mix with several elements playing different uh, parts or um, weighing differently in the technology. Why that is, is probably a, a more of a situational issue, what they are doing, where we find the, uh, the, uh, the artifacts. Very little retouch in most, not always, but in most uh, industries. So here are some uh, cores 
uh, just to show you the uh, variety. This is from the late Middle Paleolithic. I don't have, I, I don't want to waste all the time on showing you um, the whole variety. We have some idiosyncratic uh, technological behaviors that are very specific in time and in place and in sites. So like uh, on the left side for Amud, we have a specific place in the cave where people seem to be doing miniature things. So we have tiny core trimming uh, pieces and tiny blades and tiny ridge blades uh, at the top there. But that's a moment in time and then it disappears. The rest is the normal uh, variation. And we have at the end uh, in, in Kashish, there's a sort of a bladelet technology, which apparently is becoming more recognized now as research continues. But the general background is Levalois, discoidal flake industries. And of course, there are the points. The, I think the top ones are for Miss Leah from a visit to the cave, uh, just picking stuff from the surface and returning it, Mina. And uh, some, uh, and some uh, uh, pointed the uh, forms from the uh, later uh, Middle Paleolithic. So we have those two, but typically they are not the major component. So they are used probably uh, for hunting in a minute, uh, but they are not the major component almost ever in any of the assemblages. So a very similarly uniform a lithic technology. Ofer Bar Yosef thought that he could uh, um, identify it as a Levantine Mousterian as opposed to all other sorts of Mousterian that you can see here, the Nicopian um, uh, and the uh, Balkanian and the Atirian in North Africa and so on. So to him this signifies a very specific regional um, lithic culture. Faunal resources, as I said, not many changes between the various populations of the Levant. Not really any huge animals. Um, so we have the gazelle, top left. We have uh, some deer, the fallow deer, the uh, red deer. Uh, the only large, uh, or nearly only large animal that we find are the orcs, the wild cattle. And those are found mostly in open air sites. Uh, you find a tooth here, a bone there, uh, in the caves, people, uh, hominins, would not drag half a ton of animal into caves which are normally steep on the cliffs just for the meat. They would uh, cut, kill the animal, take off the meat, leave the heavy bones in the field, bring in the meat, and nobody would be the wiser when you excavate the site. But uh, this is something that we do see in the open air site. So open air and cave sites sort of complement each other in terms of the a subsistence and settlement a system. Some evidence for hunting. This is from Syria, from Uri Klel, where a piece of arguably a Levalois point was found in, in the, I think it's a vertebra of a wild ass. Um, another aspect of the diet that people typically don't talk about, but I would like to emphasize is the plant material. And I think we will hear about this from Karen, from Bruce, one way, one way or the other. Um, there are some sites where you find macrobotanical remains, like uh, the ones from uh, Kebara at the top uh, left, from uh, Duara Cave in Syria, which is about, uh, it's an older site, more or less uh, the age of Mislia, of Hayunin. And uh, recently, because again of technological advancement, we have a lot of phytolith evidence from sediments, and you can see a very rich world of uh, plants being used for food, but also for other uh, things like uh, um, bedding in Tor Farage in uh, Jordan, suggested uh, for Amud, not as clear as in Tor Farage, I think in Mislia, although I, I was not clear whether that was phytoliths or physical remains uh, for bedding. Mina? Physical remains? Uh, <coughs> uh, and some other things. So definitely plants are playing a role, which is logical, and everyone would think, who thinks about it would say, yes, that's the case, but we are looking for the evidence. Uh, and the fact is, and I think some people alluded to it in their in previous talks, that um, really there's no way that people can eat meat, 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 and meat, as 
sometimes it's claimed that Neanderthals have been doing, and stay alive. Uh, you need some other things, and these other things come from plants, and in the Levant, even more than in Europe, you'd expect this to happen. And we do find the evidence, I think, the more people look in the sediments, you find more of the plants, and you can tell by the various anatomical parts of the plants and so on, what they might have been used for. And sometimes, in fact, what they were used for, well, you have the botanical remains. Oh, sorry, that's a leftover. Half thing, I promised there's some evidence. So this is direct evidence from Humal, from Umar Klel, those bitumen used as half thing material. And um, we just need to think about the investment of energy and work in preparing the, uh, the glues, the, the bitumen, to be used as half thing. So it's not just the half thing, it's the whole technological process that is involved in preparing these half thing materials. We see evidence here. We have no idea who the hominids were. We don't have physical remains here, or oh, uh, fossil remains. And some indirect evidence from Cunetra based on the uh, distribution of patina on some uh, um, artifacts and a suggested reconstruction of the hafting. And something that I think needs to be said is that although we normally talk about hafting in the context of hunting uh, weapons, a lot of the hafting identified in the Levant, and I think also in Europe, is not necessarily connected with hunting at all. It's with scrapers and urines and other uh, such uh, things. As I said, fire everywhere. Uh, some uh, evidence for pigment use, a uh, kafte. Um, we know that it existed also in Schul. We have some pieces from En Kashish, which is a Neanderthal site. We have some engraved pieces from sites, one of them Kafte, with a known hominid. The other Cuneta doesn't have a known hominid, but there are some indications, and there you can see that they cover at least between one and 50, 100,000 years. So there's some of that. The use of shells from Kafte and from Schul, published by uh, Danny Bar Yosef and by Francesco and uh, Marianne. Marianne and Francesco. And uh, we have some uh, shells at, and uh, marine shells at Emkashish, but we're not sure they were used in quite the same way. So there's a l not a lot, but there are signs that things were happening there. And uh, so this is the record, and now I would like to try to put it in a context. And uh, the thing that I think we need to draw attention to, bear in mind the first slide with the sh very small area that I've shown you uh, is the nature of the region. And it's a complex region. I used Google Earth to show two. I hope you can see the lines. <laughs> how the topography changes uh, from north to south, that you have the distances measured. Um, and you can see how it changes from east or west to east. There's the rift in the middle. The, the differences are really significant in the sense that they would uh, in, require that hominids do things differently from one place to the other. It's a complex terrain, and complex terrains do generate a lot of biodiversity, as recently pointed out by Badgley and Al, and I think Jeff uh, Bailey has been working along similar line with his group, showing that complex terrain, tectonics, faults, uh, topographic differences create interesting uh, a topography that produces interesting and plentiful and diverse resources. And when you combine it with complex climate systems, such as the ones that we have in the Levant, where the Siberian system, the Atlantic system, the monsoon system, and then some others all interact in quite diverse, dynamic, and not always expected ways, then you get a region that has a lot of biodiversity, a lot of affordances, a lot of resources. It becomes a region that where people or hominids can move around, they can move from north to south, from east to west, on small scales, on small geographic distances, and move from one ecozone to the other quite easily, or quite 
fast, maybe not easily, but fast. So this is attractive. And this is also a landscape that calls for an um, invasion of species. We, uh, there is a, this is the botanical distribution today, which probably ma uh, more or less mimics or shows what things were in the past. So we have the Mediterranean zone along the Mediterranean line and on the high plateau uh, east of the rift. We have the rift itself, which has a tropical environment almost all the way up north. And then we have the mountain ranges, uh, which kind of play the ecotone between the two. And as you move south, you go into more and more arid environments, which would require more planning and more elaborate uh, use of technology, movement, settlement systems, and so on. So it's a small region. It's very diverse. It has a lot of affordances. And because of that, it probably also uh, brings in invasive species. It's a fluctuating resource model. Um, Davis and uh, et al., uh, I think as of 2000, and even earlier, talked about this. Uh, and I want to emphasize that this fluctuating resource uh, situation is not a moment in time. It's not something that happens and then disappears. It's a balance act between all these uh, ecological uh, uh, elements, ecological factors, and sometimes the region will be more uh, attractive and sometimes it will be less attractive in the sense that invasion and colonization uh, could be easier. This is a model developed for plants, I should, <laughs> should point it out, but uh, some of the principles can probably be uh, applied to hominins as well. <laughs> and um, Some parts of the Levant would be better suited for hosting large uh, communities. For example, if you go to the Mediterranean zone and climate shifts, there are climate changes, there's a drying out, or never a major drying out. Um, I should emphasize that climate changes are never as dramatic, abrupt uh, as they are in Europe. It's a much milder scale of changes uh, which helps, but uh, still uh, the Mediterranean area and uh, zone, and especially the north of it, would be more hospitable and would have a larger carrying capacity than would have the Mediterranean zone to the east or as you move to the south, and obviously to the, uh, when you move into semi-arid and arid regions, because when you reduce precipitation by 10% from, I don't know, 800 millimeters, that's a still a viable environment. If you reduce it from 50 millimeters, that may be a live or die situation and populations might just evacuate and move uh, uh, into the uh, Mediterranean zone. <coughs> uh, we have evidence, plenty of evidence from a lot of work on climate that the same configuration existed throughout the Middle Paleolithic and so we have evidence from climate uh, reconstructions based on isotopic work um, done by Mira Matthews, Amos Funkin, and many others, uh, mostly in the Geological Survey of Israel, suggesting, and you can see here uh, very quickly, the warmer and colder, more and less precipitation, and you can see that there were hominids populating the region basically throughout drier, more wet, uh, uh, more humid, uh, phases. It's never a situation where people had to evacuate the region because it was unhabitable. Um, so how do hominids in the Mediterranean zone and in general uh, adjust to the changes of the climate? I want to show you one uh, case, uh, one uh, example, not really a case study, but one example. Um, Amud Cave has been studied for, it's a climatic uh, situation. It was studied by Chris Halin and Margaret Schoinger in 2012, um, trying to compare it with Kafze and to show that, as things were at the time, moderns and uh, Neanderthals were exploiting uh, the region in two different uh, periods and therefore in two different climate uh, uh, regimes. And they got to their conclusion that indeed uh, the Neanderthals used a much a 
more humid environment and the people coming from Africa could adapt to a drier uh, um, climate. Uh, several years after that, we threw in strontium analysis uh, to check for the uh, origins, the geographic origins of the hunted prey. We didn't dare start with the hominids, so we started with the prey. Um, based on the assumption that strontium uh, isotopes sort of track given sufficient differences, and that was the work of uh, Gidon Hartmann, who looked at the uh, um, strontium bioavailability in the region, how the basalts and the uh, soils, the different soils, uh, uh, preserve the strontium, how it fractionates, and he could actually figure out that what we are seeing at Amud is not really so much a matter of climate change, but a matter of uh, changes in the hunting territories. So uh, during the times of Amud B4, which is dated to about 70, beginning of marine isotope shape, stage 4, uh, the hominids were walking higher up in order to get the gazelles. When we go to stage three, about 55,000 years ago, the top of the sequence of Hamoud, the same gazelle. If you just looked at the fauna, you wouldn't know that they came from different areas. The same gazelles were hunted much farther down a uh, slope near the uh, Lake of Galilee. So what we are seeing here, according to Gidon, uh, is that we are looking at the Amud hominids, we know that B1 hominids were Neanderthals. We assume, but we don't know, that B4 were also Neanderthals. They were just shifting their territories. They were reorganizing their settlement patterns in order to adjust to the same prey, to, 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 to hunt the same animals that they used to, but they just go somewhere else to hunt them. We're now trying to check this with some other species that are less generalist and more obligate than the gazelles to see if the, it follows the same. And preliminary results suggest that this is actually the case. They're just shifting their territories, their hunting territories, their settlement arrangements to uh, hunt the prey. And we have some support for this from the work on uh, lithic raw material uh, done by Ravid Eckstein for her uh, thesis. And what she noticed was that during the times of B4, which is the big arrow on top. A flint arrived from the local sources, about five kilometers tops maximum from the site, but also from regions that were about 30 and 40 kilometers away. At the times of B1, we have the same pattern, but there's much more emphasis on the local exploitation in the area of the site where they hunt the gazelles, and far less evidence for a walking up, uphill and at the distances to the west in order to bring in uh, some flint. So these two independent lines of evidence suggest very similar behaviors. Uh, <coughs> so we are looking at groups that live in small or exploit from each side small territories. Uh, John and I, some, uh, some years ago, we played with numbers just to see what could uh, what could be the situation, the pecking of, a home, of a Neanderthal groups on the uh, landscape. And John came up with some numbers, I think it was from California, um, some numbers of similar, or relatively similar Mediterranean uh, uh, climate uh, to show how many people could be uh, supported by a certain uh, area. Um, I think that probably in uh, the uh, Mediterranean forest, as we understand it in the Levant, biodiversity might have been higher, carrying capacity might have been a little bit higher, and uh, on the configuration of the landscape, as I showed it before, with the topography and the climate and the small distances involved, actually you could pack in quite a number of uh, groups which would be exploiting small territories and could still be living uh, next to another. This is, of course, a very dense uh, model of this, but you can see that if a group occupies this area, uh, it has quite a lot of resources to move it to. So the groups could be uh, arranging their territories on a west-east uh, axis and exploit quite a number of 
uh, environments, and they could move uh, north and south and change with seasons, with precipitation and so on, and still be uh, within a pretty small area. Now, this does not ver work very well when you speak, when you think about moderns and Neanderthals and how they can live in such a small territory, but <coughs> we did hear that uh, uh, from genetics, there is an inference uh, suggesting that, in fact, there was some uh, introgression from moderns into Neanderthals uh, at around 100,000 years old, and this was suggested by Kul Milm Al to have occurred in the Levant. So maybe, although we do not have the genetic evidence, uh, genetics sort of indirectly helps us to understand or to, to better formulate maybe some ideas about how things could have been uh, between these groups of hominids uh, in, on this uh, small uh, terrain. Um, Flint sourcing again comes uh, as another line of evidence suggesting small territories exploited by these hominids. Again, from the work of uh, Eckstein, uh, most of the sites when you look at a uh, daily exploitation territories, but not just the ideal circles as some people would have it, but adjusted to topography because there is steep topo topography at some places and not so steep in others. So time, uh, w walking time would differ from one site to the other. But so Ravid did all this and we see that most sites are pretty localized and we would expect if there are uh, groups uh, uh, using small territories that most of the material, the lithic material, would come from these smaller territories, which turns out to be the case. And <coughs> uh, there are some uh, interesting patterns in this raw material uh, 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 data that I would like to emphasize now. Basically, complex terrain increases diversity, as we said, uh, biodiversity, but it's uh, probably also conducive to a higher variability, diversity, separation, and uh, again, some maybe connectivity at some uh, uh, level or another, also with material uh, behavior or cultural behavior. And uh, what we are looking at here are two sites, uh, and Kashish on the left and Amud on the right, uh, where the raw material work was done. And you can see some very interesting patterns. Uh, en Kashish is in the Israel Valley. It's on a flat surface, just below the escarpment of Mount Carmel. Uh, we can see that flint arrives either as a, a preliminary, from preliminary sources, from sec secondary sources, from two areas to the west, from the northwest and from the southwest. The southwest, they actually go a little bit outside of the daily territory uh, in order to bring in the flint from primary resources. We have not identified so far, when, and we now have a much larger sample of flint and a much larger excavated area from that site. There's nothing coming from the east. There's fantastic flint to the east. The ecology is not different, so if somebody would invoke what Binford called embedded procurement, so they were going to hunt, and they picked up the flint uh, on the way. There are gazelles, there are deer, also to the east of the site. Uh, but they don't appear to be brought from there. We don't know about the fauna, but the flint was not picked up from there. Why? It's a different, it's a difficult question. Uh, one suggestion is that this is a social boundary. People exploiting the site of Enkashish would not venture to the east because this is an area was that other groups were occupying. This seems a little bit far-fetched, but when you look, oh, again, at, uh, sorry, when you look at Amud Cave, we find something which is very similar for both the early and the later uh, occupations. Most of the material, as I said before, comes from very local resources, so they are really moving in small circles, so to speak. Then there's some material coming from distances of 30 or 40 or even unknown distances uh, away, just unidentified resources, but there are buffer zones. There's a buffer zone between 10 and 30 kilometers, which has flint, but 
none was brought into the site. So they're not exploiting this particular part of the site. So again, maybe it has to do with the ecology, maybe it has to do with hunting behavior, maybe it has to do with subsistence, but it could also be an issue of social uh, demarcation of not using these territories because other groups may have been um, a, exploiting them. They do go farther away and bring some flint from other places uh, that are much farther, but in small, much smaller quantities. And it seems very haphazard because there's tiny fractions of the raw material assemblage that come from these distant uh, uh, sources. And they are very valuable. So sometimes they go there, sometimes they go there, they bring stuff in. But they're not exploiting the area between 10 and 30 kilometers away from the site. Um, maybe I'll skip this last one, <laughs> although it does speak to the uh, cultural um, differentiation between the groups. Uh, to sum up this evidence, uh, comparing Amunda Kibara, this is a work done by Masha Krakowski uh, in preparation now, uh, we looked at the triangular points, the ones that I showed you before, because these are elements that are being created at the, during the napping process. They are not retouched. They all have these triangular pointed shapes and uh, they are, the, the shape is defined during napping. Um, to cut a long story short, we've done some geometric morphometric, 3D uh, geometric morphometric analysis on these points and we see in the shape itself, there is no difference between Kibara and Amud either between the sites or between any uh, layer within the sites that we compared. We compared, of course, layers that are of the same chronology uh, to be sure that we're looking at the same time period, more or less, as far as can be done in archaeology. Uh, when you look at the specific way, the technological uh, gesture, the technological uh, ways of preparing these points, you see differences. Kibara shows a very standardized way of making things, so it's a very real tradition to make this one point, the shape of which is exactly the same as at Amud. At Amud, we see a, a lot more variation. So there's not one tradition. Now, this was to be expected to a degree because the lower level of Amud is about 70, uh, hundred. 70,000 years old, whereas uh, Amud B2, B1, and Kabara are about 60 or 55 even. So uh, Amud B4 was, B, B4 was the outgroup. We wanted to see whether it would pattern with the other uh, assemblages, and it didn't. The thing is that B1 and B2 also don't pattern together, so this is strange. But again, uh, there is some suggestion that we are looking at a, a real a, a tradition of doing things that is separating the groups occupying Kebara, at least from the groups occupying Amud. So, to sum up, what have we learned uh, over the, or what have I learned over the last three decades? Um, I think the idea that the Levant is a corridor uh, should be neglected. It's a region where people were uh, existing, doing pretty well, um, it was not a corridor in the sense that people did not go there just to stay or to, to go through. They came there to stay, and I think they did stay. We have more and more evidence suggesting that there was an extended period of uh, uh, occupation and that people were doing quite well in the Levant. And in fact, there's always a lot of talk about refugia in the uh, Pleistocene. I think maybe this is the refugia, <laughs> refugium, the one. So it's an area that really attracted people. Um, I think that uh, the diversity of environments of a small area uh, creates what Sewell Wright called a, a fitness landscape. I would add a rugged fitness uh, landscape where different groups living at slightly different uh, standards of living, should I say, could find their location in that balance with slight, but very slight, as far as we can see from the archaeology, changes or differences in the way they exploited their uh, environment. Uh, 
as a fun. The Middle Paleolithic hominins in the Levant did very much the same things, whether they are Neanderthals, the modern Unuans, or one large population that cannot be differentiated. There's really not a, a signature of any Neanderthal behavior in that particular region. Again, it may be specific to the Levant because of its lenient environment, and, and not so much for other things, but it could be also something that we have to consider regarding other uh, regions. And uh, I want to say that for me, what I see, the differences that we can uh, detect in the Levant, and maybe also in other regions, um, uh, cannot be uh, associated to taxonomy or to species-specific behavior. Uh, if you look at the Epipaleolithic in the Levant, uh, say the Kabaran, uh, say the, any other Epipaleolithic culture, and you look at the Neolithic, you'd say, oh, these are very different things. And indeed they are, because there's something happening in the Neolithic that is different. There's some, but you will not go and say because of that that we are looking at different species. And I think we are looking here at something like this, and especially when we move from the middle to the upper Paleolithic, uh, this is exactly the same situation. Uh, but this is a story for another talk, I guess. Thank you.